utmost potential. God, we want to acknowledge that you are here. And we also want to invite the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us uh, as we spend this time together in Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, as Cindy has been faithfully uh, sending out the, uh, the text messages to all of us, uh, Cindy is uh, one of the uh, impeccable communicators uh, who reminds us, who calls upon us. And speaking of calling upon us, uh, she called upon me, I think it was a couple of months ago, uh, three months ago, and uh, asking me if I could uh, head out in a afternoon seminar with the Master Guy trainee, although I am one of the trainees, and so uh, I'm going to be learning together. And, and so today, we're going to be covering three seminars. Uh, and as you saw on the, uh, the slide screen, I'm going to have two hours to do this. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at the first one, Principles of Children's Evangelism. Uh, we're going to keep it around 30 minutes, and then we're going to transition over to how to lead a child to Christ. And so we're going to keep it at 30 minutes time frame, and then how to use your gifts uh, in about half an hour so that we're going to have another 20 minutes to 30 minutes to dialogue, to talk, because I want this to be an interactive session. Uh, I want this to be a time where we can talk and we can learn from one another as we look at some of these points. So without further ado, uh, we're going to be looking at the principles of children and youth evangelism. Um, I believe the assignment was for me to focus on children, but when it comes to the principles of youth and the, uh, the children's evangelism, the principles will apply to youth. Uh, as a matter of fact, it will apply to uh, young adults and also everyone who uh, is young at heart, right? So uh, without further ado, just going over to the Word of God, coming straight from Luke chapter 24, verse 46 to 47. Could uh, someone uh, volunteer and read this for us? And I'm going to pass the mic over to you, Frank, so you can. Oh, you got, you got a mic. So I'm going to follow, and, uh, and I'm going to change the slide as you go, Frank. All right, so please do us the honor. Um, then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Luke 24. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And so reading these two verses, what this verse have to do with child evangelism or principles of child evangelism, youth evangelism, and I underscore the words to all nations. Looking at the next slide, it says here, Jesus' desire is that repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. So the mission field is all nations. And going over to the next slide, it says that there are no geographical restriction to the gospel, no culture restrictions, and no age restrictions. Everyone needs to hear the gospel, including the children of all nations. Amen? Amen. So this is the word of God. And I believe that this word is going to set the tone for the rest of our time together. One of the greatest joys in seeing a young child come to faith in Christ. Unfortunately, there are those who do not understand that a child has both the mental capability and the spiritual intuition to make a definitive decision to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We're talking about many of the adults who do not have the understanding of the capability of our children when it comes to their mental intelligence and when it comes to their spiritual in intuition. Some struggle to realize the necessity of inviting children to respond in faith to the message of the gospel. Uh, this is written by Chris Nolan, a Biblical Defense of Child Evangelism, on uh, an article. But 
And so it says, and so the next slide is, do not underestimate children's mental capability and spiritual institu intuition to understand God and the things of God and make decisions for God. As you know, I have two little ones, and, and um, whenever we're having worship, whenever we're having prayer time, or, you know, we're just walking uh, and, and hiking or something catches their attention, and these little ones will say something that is so deep and so profound that you have to be connected to the great I am to be able to speak something out of the mouth of the babes. Amen? Now, we know her, Ellen White from Child Guidance, page 490 to 491. Children of 8, 10, or 12 years are old enough to be addressed on the subject of personal religion. Yeah. Do not teach your children with reference of some future period when they shall be old enough to repent and believe the truth. It properly instructed ev ev a very young children may have correct views of their state as sinners and of the way of salvation through Christ. So again, going back to those words, do not underestimate. When it comes to mental capability and spiritual intuition of our little ones. And we got a bunch of them here at this church. Amen? And, and so Ellen White says that sweet spot of, of addressing the issues of sins and addressing the condition of our hearts, addressing that we are in a jam in the pickle, yeah, that has eternal ramification, and she says, take time and seize the opportunity in this age group, 8, 9, 10, 11. As a matter of fact, just recently studying, um, uh, preparing for baptism for Jaden, and then later on with Angelo, uh, two uh, uh, boys who come to our church and goes to Sabbath school. They, they are part of the Adventure Club, and they're looking forward to become a Pathfinder. Um, and so I picked up this book by Review and Herald Publishing Association, and this is a baptismal study guide uh, entitled, Making Jesus My Best Friend, Baptismal Preparation for Younger Children, Especially for Ages 8 to 10. And when you go to the prologue of this study guide, yeah, this study guide also says, this is what Sister Y have said, that's why we have put together a study guide. There's a lot of study guide uh, preparing, you know, youth and even early teens and young adults for baptism. But at, at, in Adventist Church, up until this was written, uh, let me see here. Yeah, this was written back in 2005. So up till 2005, we didn't have a baptismal study guide that is age appropriate for 8, 9, 10, 11 years of age. Yeah. But I thank the Lord that we have something now. And moving along... Here is George Barna's study. George Barna is a massive, yeah, a, a nationwide uh, a surveyor and especially researches churches and organization. In George Barna's study back in 2004, this is what it says. Family churches and parachurch ministries must recognize that primary window of opportunity for effectively reaching people with the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection is during the preteen years. We already got the info from Ellen White. And then finally, at 2004, this is what is being mentioned. So now and again, I think it's good to see, you know, what the survey says and, and what the statistics shows. It says here under underscore, it is during those years that people develop their frames of reference for the remainder of their life, especially theologically and morally. So if you want to instill something that has eternal ramification, if you, have, if you want to instill something that will take not only all the way through their lifetime, when they have to make all kinds of difficult decisions that impact not only themselves, but their spouses and, and, and their family, their kids, and their workplaces, their community, it is during the preteen years. Yeah. 
Yeah. No pressure, though, Wanda. <laughs> no, no pressure. No pressure, uh, those who serve in the Venture Club. Uh, but God has called each and every one of you for such a time as this. And, and, and so, yeah, it says they're consistently explaining and modeling truth principles for young people is the most critical factor in the spiritual development. And so this is what the statistics shows. Yeah. So going back to the Bible, going back to the center of everything, Jesus was all about child evangelism, and Jesus is still all about child evangelism. Amen. Let's look at this. Could somebody volunteer to read this for us? Anyone? Yes, thank you. Then they brought little children to him, that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. <laughs> Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will, be no means enter, will by no means enter into it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Julie. In the children who were brought in contact with him, Jesus saw the men and women who should be heirs of his grace and subject of his kingdom, and some of whom would become martyrs for his sake. I'm reading a quote from Ellen White. He knew that these children would listen to him and accept him as their redeemer far more readily, ladies and gentlemen, would grown-up people. <laughs> many of whom were the worldly, wise, and hard-hearted. In teaching, he came down to their level. He, the majesty of heaven, answered their questions and simplified his important lessons to meet their childish understanding. He planted in their minds the seeds of truth. And this is going to come up all throughout the seminar today. Planting the seed. Oh, the, um, the passage that you read? Yeah, the one I just read. Yes. Uh, let me just go back to it. Mark 10, 13 to 16. If, if I was Luis, I would just tell you right there on the spot. Yeah. Uh, but my mind, is, mind does not work that well. Uh, I need to brush up. Yes. And so going back to Ellen White's, yeah, this is from Evangelism, page 579. And as a matter of fact, when you go to that book, there is a section called Child Evangelism. Yeah. He, the majesty of heaven, answered their questions and simplified his important lesson to meet their childish understanding. He planted in their minds the seeds of truth, which in after years would spring up and bear fruit unto eternal life. I just want you guys to put a bookmark on there because we're going to be talking about this planting of seed and letting that seed germinate and to sprout and to grow. I don't know if you guys are plant lovers or if you guys have done any farming, but uh, if you don't have patience, don't do it. <laughs> it's a process. Yeah. So just looking at some of the biblical support and and. As I mentioned to you, we have 30 minutes on each section uh, and uh, somewhat. And so um, you can take this down um, uh, in your notes. Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Now, we read this all, all, you know, many of times. But let's look at verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You know, this particular text has everything to do with what happens in the confines of your home. Before you get up and get out, get out of the bed and dress to your Sabbath best to come to church, this needs to happen in your home. Homes, especially if you have little ones. Now, you say, well, I'm an empty nesters, but grandpas and grandpas, grandpas and grandmas, 
it is not too late. Yeah. And looking at the next one, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as uh, front, uh, frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your guests, uh, on your gates. And then let's look at Deuteronomy 31, 9 through 13. I'm going to zoom, zoom through this. So Moses wrote down this law and gave into the Levitical priests who carried the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. Then Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years in the year of, of canceling debts during the festival of tabernacles when all Israel come to appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose, you shall read this law before them in their hearing. Assemble the people. Every time we think about assembling people, sometimes it's easy for us to just think about adults. But when God says assemble the people, it says here men, women, and children and the foreigners residing in your town so they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of this law. People of Israel understood about child evangelism. Their children who do not know this law must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God. And we can go into, you know, deep dive about what fear of the Lord means. It's not, oh, I'm afraid of God. Utmost reverence and respect. In the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So, you know, there's a type and antitype here. Israelites are about to get to the promised land, and God is saying, I want you guys to be ready and stay ready, and I want everyone to be ready, including children. And entrusting the Levitical priests, Moses, Aaron, all the big guns to say, watch out for these kids, because I want these kids to make it to the promised land. Psalms 78, 1 through 8. My people hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things of, the, of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statues for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. Here's another one. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. The word of God, the law of God needs to be handed down. There should never be a disconnect. Yet the fact of the matter is that Within North American division, I believe there are over 10 million young people who have left the church. So, if we have kept this, if we have take heed to what the Word of God says from the time of Moses, where would be, would we be? Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds and would keep his commands. They would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious regeneration. Those hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. Proverbs 22, 6, you know this. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Just plant a seed. And maybe, perhaps, it seems like most of the time, they will wonder and they will stray. But they will have the coordinates to come back to where they have started. It's about planting the seed. And it's scary. And I, I don't want to even think about the possibility of my son, Jaden and Kylie, to stray away. But knowing that I have strayed away too, I'm thinking to myself, that time may very well come in the future. But in the age of 8, 9, 10, 11, Jaden is already 10. He has one more year. Kylie is 8, so she has 8, 9, 10, 11, three more years. 
where in Christ-centered atmosphere and environment, we can instill the way of God. Looking at Ephesians 6, 1 to 4, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. And, and this commandment is not just directed to the children. For children to honor mommy and daddy, mommy and daddy need to be honor worthy. Amen? Amen. If I'm acting a fool and to say, well, you better listen, this is what the Bible says, the fifth commandment, they're, they're, when they get to age 12, they're going to say, daddy, just get out of here. You're just a bunch of hypocrites, and I'm going to go my way. That it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. This is a commandment. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in, a tra- in the training and admonition of the Lord. You know, the <laughs> I'm, as, as I think about what happens at home, it's very difficult at times to keep that balance. I'm just, I'm just being very real because we're... We're trained to be master guides, so I want to be as honest as I can be. It's so easy for me to provoke them. And it may work, yeah, at a certain age. But I know that when it comes to that, that, that you know, after that sweet spot of their age group, yeah, I, I know they, they, they may still, you know, show respect and not say anything back at me, but I'm sure they're going to think it to say, wait till I turn 18. I'm going to. Get out of this whole scene and get out of Dodge yeah, and live my own life, Lord forbid. 2 Timothy 3.15. Now, Timothy was the protege of Paul. Amen? That, the, that from childhood you have known the Holy Scripture. Timothy, known the Holy Scripture when he was a kid. Yeah which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And, and we're like, okay, where, where did he get this? When I call to remember the genuine faith that is in you, which dwell first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Annette, what you are doing is being passed down to your granddaughters. Just like Lois Pass down what she knows, the word of God, the, the commandments of God, the law of God to Timothy. Yeah, so we got grandmas and, and, and we got parents. And so please do not lose heart. I continue to think about my dear beloved grandmother who instilled so much of the moral and values and the truth of the Bible. Uh, that's just one of the motivating factors for me to see her on that glorious morning. Looking at that next one, Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you need to speak. You need to voice it. Don't wait for the pastor to speak. Don't wait for the elders. When you're at home, you take the rightful position of the priests and the priestesses and you speak life into your children, your grandkids. This is the commandment of God. Matthew 21, 15, but when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. See the polar opposite? Kids were praising Jesus. Adults, indignant. Look at this. Children are fully able to praise and worship God. Praise and worship is not something children must wait until they are older. And I think many church fails nine times out of ten. Maybe because, you know, kids are not that, you know, I don't don't know, skilled. Or uh, maybe, you know, their musicality is not at the level of some of these, you know, musically trained adults. But God does not look at our appearance. He looks at our hearts. And God says, I can take what comes out of the mouth of the babes. Then the Juilliard, is it Juilliard, the music, music school? Train, you know, somebody that has no heart of worship to God. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, 
it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. I mean, Jesus is taking it very seriously when it comes to how we deal with our children. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus is saying, yeah, James, you better watch out because it's better for you to put a millstone around your neck and go in the depth of the sea because I'm in the business of speaking life into guiding, directing the little ones to the heavenly kingdom. I think these passages shows that they have perhaps clear connectivity to the great I am. And taking it closer to home, I, I was just so overjoyed. I was sitting there, and I was looking over here as the ukulele club was leading us into the worship. And I just love how Lillian holds her ukulele. I think ukulele is bigger than her. But she holds that thing with so much pride. And I know that she's not up there to say, hey, look at me. She is just so happy she gets to do this with her classmates and do this with the club. She loves the school environment, and she gets to do it at her home church. She was in cloud nine. And so she was just praising God, and it was exuding. And so, so you know, to give our children the platform, even if they blunder, make a blunder, even if they're not, you know, in tune, who cares? We're here to worship God. And, you know, if we ever think that we're going to outsing, you know, the heavenly angels, then, boy, God better <laughs> humble us. Yeah. Jesus specifies that these children are among those who believe in me. This plainly indicates that children can believe in Jesus. If they can believe in Jesus, they, then we must evangelize them. Amen. If we fail to share the gospel with the next generation, we risk repeating Israel's mistake in Judges 2, 10, and 11. When all the generation have been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. <laughs> then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baal. Study up on what they do. You know, don't, don't do it uh, when you're ready to go to sleep. The bell practice is absolute debaucherous, wicked, evil. And it's because the message and the truth wrapped around in the love of Jesus was not handed down from generation to generation to generation. Sharing the gospel with children is commanded and blessed by God. Amen? It's a command and it's a blessing. Yeah. And I'm just going to zoom by this one. And um, I'm going to talk to Tim if I could get this um, all on some kind of a PDF file so that you don't need to take notes. And we'll, we'll, um, I'm looking at the time. And, and boy, <laughs> Cindy... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> try, to, try to keep the time frame. So 20 non-negotiable principles for evangelizing kids. I thought this was so practical that I wanted to share with you all. Uh, it was written by Wayne Stocks, a founder and executive director of Hope for Hurting Kids. And also he writes books and articles for Hope for, you know, uh, kids who have gone through divorce, divorce, divorce parents. Um, and so here we are. Number one. Non-negotiable principle for child evangelism, pray. Like everything that we do, prayer should be our default when it comes to evangelizing kids. We should ask God to give us the wisdom to speak his word into the lives of the kids under our influence. We should pray for open hearts and open minds that are ripe to be sown with the message of God's exceeding grace. Number two. Remember that what you are doing is God's work. 
no matter how zealous you are or how good you think you are at leading kids to Christ, bringing kids into kingdom is ultimately the job of God. If we forget this, and if we're doing this all on our, 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 all, all on our own, help me, God. Help us all. From our standpoint, that means we should pray, prepare, and share. But in the end, you must be willing, I must be willing to always allow yourself to be guided by the Holy Spirit. So I think about the day, hopefully soon, sooner than later, when we are pinned. As master guys, I, I have dreams now. Because I see the light at the end of the tunnel, ladies and gentlemen. But just because we have this title called Master Guide, we are master guides because we are following the master designer, the creator, the great I am. And we are led by the Holy Spirit to lead others to Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. When presenting the gospel to kids, or anyone for that matter, it is important to remember that it is his gospel, and it's all about Jesus. Number four, importance of teaching the concept of sin. All too often, when it comes to children, we tend to shy away from sharing the idea of sin and judgment. We say, oh, that's not age appropriate. But we read from child guidance. Uh, we looked at some of the articles. It all points to the fact that we need to give them. Of course, it needs to be age appropriate. I, I'm not sure, and I don't. I'm, you know, I don't think we should ever talk about the goriness of of Jesus's, you know, uh, torture and and things of that nature. They can study up on that when they come to an age. But all too often, we tend to shy away from sharing the idea of sin and judgment. And I must be very open and honest that. Perhaps sometimes we struggle with sharing because we're struggling with this thing called sin as well. However, a child cannot understand the need for the gospel and their own personal need for Jesus until they can comprehend and understand that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. Children need to understand that they are sinners and everyone they know is a sinner. Now, I didn't swap notes with Larry Grimaldi, but I believe just last Sabbath, Larry Grimaldi gave a children's story about how we are all sinners saved by grace. We need to talk about these things. Not, so, not because we want to condemn them and we want to shame them, but as we understand the concept of sin. And then when you bring in the truth about the Jesus Christ and his grace and what he has done on the cross, Kids will be banging at the doors of these ministries to say, Miss Julie, Mr. Louise, Miss Annette, Mr. Frank, Mr. Tim, Miss Cindy, Miss Wanda, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Yeah. Number five, some context is helpful. Give an overview of God's plan and work in history. I believe Seventh-day Adventists, I'm not trying to gloat, but I think we're good at telling stories, Amen. Context is everything. For example, speaking of sin, some context is helpful. Yeah. Jumping right to Jesus died on the cross, now make him the Lord your life is not helpful. An explanation of the history of God's work in history is helpful. That's where telling story comes into place. That's when you bring object lessons and illustrations comes into place. Number six, Point to the Bible, not a feeling. Salvation is about the work of Jesus, not a feeling. Give them the concrete truth. Salvation is not a feeling. While there may be feelings that accompany salvation like happiness and joy, these should not be promised or interpreted as evidence of salvation. Why? Because Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it. Yeah. When you are evangelizing children, it is important to lead them through God's word. Salvation is based on the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross. For a child whose cognitive abilities are not fully developed, it is important not to rely on emotional appeals to bring a child to Christ. 
Now, mind you, if we use emotion, we will be able to baptize many. But I believe we are misusing the sacredness of the Word of God. And then we begin to, or we need to start ask, asking ourselves, who are we doing this for? Yeah. So, understanding the concept of sin. Understanding why Jesus came to this earth. And when those two truths combine, then all of us, not just kids, will say, Lord, I am not worthy, but I want to receive your It is about trusting Jesus with their lives and having a relationship with him, not just knowing him. The Bible is clear that even the demons understand that Jesus is the Son of God. While it is critical that we give kids a firm foundation in the doctrine of the Bible, a saving knowledge constitutes both head and heart knowledge of Jesus. I have been told that the longest distance between one point and another is be, be, from, from your head to your heart. So we can pump them with all the great knowledge of the Bible. But evangelists of the children need to know by the unction of the Holy Spirit to transfer that knowledge to their hearts. We must transfer a certain amount of requisite knowledge to kids in order to, for them to understand God's story and his plan in human history. We must point them towards a heart knowledge of Jesus and encourage a relationship with him. And that's why I thank the Lord that now these days, uh, even within the Adventist circle and Adventist organization, you have baptismal study guides that is so Christ-centered and grace-centered. As a matter of fact, this 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 study guide here, it doesn't even ask the pastors to do it. It says, take this booklet and study it amongst the family. As a matter of fact, right now, presently, we have a family who's doing just that. Got, I think, four copies of this. And they're using this as worship and study and 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 and. The both parents, mommy and daddy, said, Pastor, we're going to do this because we need to rededicate our lives to Jesus. Yeah. It's about relationship. Jesus is a real person. It's about connectivity with him. It's about more than just being Jesus' friend. There is a song that I like, I'm a friend of God. And, you know, and, 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 uh, and he is my friend. But, to reduce Jesus to just a forever friend ignores his power and glory. He did, after all, speak the world into existence, and he does sustain us every moment when we make him to, make him to be, sorry, our, our, the Lord of our life. He does become a trusted friend, but he will always be infinitely more. So there's a balance between, yes, I am, Jesus is my friend, but Jesus also needs to be your Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Because, you know, sometimes when you're friends, it's, 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 it's kind of difficult to obey each other. Yeah. But when you have the Lord and the King, now you obey. Yeah. So we need to, we need to break that down to our kids. Number nine, lay a foundation and don't get discouraged. God doesn't always work on our timetable. Sometimes things happen so much quicker than we ever imagined they could. And other times it seems as if God has forgotten our prayers, sometimes, something he never does. Much of what we do in working with kids is planting seeds. So here's, here's that truth again. Hopefully planting them deep in fertile, fertile soil Part of the nature of working with kids, especially younger kids, is that we may never get to see the fruit from those seeds. So, if you sign up to be evangelists of kids, you guys are seed planters. That's all you do. Never seen the result. Not harvesters. I would love to be a harvester. Yeah, 
and, you know, get, 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 the, get the good, you know, the piece of the pie. Because that's where the celebration happens. That's where the joy happens. But we're, we're talking, if you sign up to be a part of a children's ministry, it's, it's the mundane, it's the, it's, you know, it's sometimes it, it, it feels like a grind. Yeah. But the Bible says, do not lose heart. Nonetheless, we must persevere with patience and determination because the very first attribute of love of God is patience. Love is patience. Love is kind. Uh, I just saw Cindy just rolling her eyes. <laughs> oh, boy. This love thing is, 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 a, is a tall order. Continue to plant the seeds of the gospel and pray that God would use them at some point in that child's life to blossom into a beautiful tree that will bear, bear fruit for Christ. Never get discouraged that you are not seeing immediate results. God sees the work that you are doing, and you can rest assured that it is part of his grand plan. So it takes a special group of individuals to do this. Because nine times out of ten, you will not see the harvest. You may not live to that time. And God is saying, don't worry about it. We're going we're gonna to celebrate on that glorious morning when we sit at the banqueting table. And people sitting right to you and left of you are all those individuals that you have planted with much perseverance. And I know in getting to know each of you more and more, you guys are planters. Not just here at him at Seventh Avenue Church. But I, I know that Cindy's a planter. Everywhere she goes, I see Maddie and Mackenzie there. Annette, she's a planter. Every time I take my kids, now and again, just to give my wife a break, Annette is there every single day, Monday through Friday. She's here on Sabbath for her kids, and then turning around on Monday, she starts it all over again. Seed planting. And if I could be honest with you, you know, you look at Izzy and Lily growing up, and then we're looking at Annette's age. You know, as long as we live here on this earth, and, and if Jesus doesn't, doesn't come anytime soon in our lifetime, Annette will not be able to see every seed you have planted. But that's why we have the blessed hope in Jesus Christ, amen? It doesn't end at the profession of faith, ladies and gentlemen. We just had baptism, Angelo, 10-year-old. And we've, we celebrate, and we should celebrate. But that's the beginning point, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we all say, oh, you know, I just can sit down and just relax. But journey begins. A decision to follow Christ is a special moment. There is no denying that. If you have ever been privileged enough to be there when a child chooses to make Jesus the, the, the Lord of their life, you know the overwhelming sense of joy and hope that it brings. The moment should be celebrated. Remember, though, that a profession of faith is only the beginning of child's spiritual journey. It marks the beginning of a lifetime of learning, discipleship, and building a relationship with their Lord and Savior. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a work of a lifetime. At the expense of your health, at the expense of your sanity, at the expense of paying more money on medications and patches. And all of you have the right to say, I'm out. I'm going to retire. Yet, Julie, you are still here. Planting seed. Planting seed. Make sure that you do not forget about child just because you have gotten them to the point of profession of faith. Ensure that a system is in place that will continue to disciple them and lead them in their spiritual journey. I think church fails because there is no follow-up plan. Brother Alex, 
I'm sure we can give a mic over to him and he can explain why. Why churches are failing. No, 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 I I was just a hypothetical. Thank you, Larry. (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, we're all master guide trainees. And I appreciate, Alex, your openness and your vulnerability in sharing with us even your experience. There's no follow-up plan. Baptism is a beginning of a lifetime. And God is saying, are you, are you willing to go the distance? And sometimes, you know, when you are a kid like me when I was growing up, you know, uh, parents will get a lot of letters from the principal's office. Not a good one. It's, it's not commendation, you know, certificates and such. It's because all the troubles that I made. Sometimes I'm surprised that, that I didn't get arrested and sent to jail. I'm just being very open. And even in those hurtful experience of saying, I'm doing all of this and this is how you repay me, God is saying, keep planting the seed. Keep planting the seed. Be ready at all times. Yeah. Be quick on your feet. Be the quickest draw on the west. Be ready. What does, this, what does this entail? But sanctify the Lord your God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Yeah. When it says everyone, children are included. Amen. Be ready. But make sure when you give a defense of why you have faith in Jesus Christ, that you will do it with meekness and fear. If it's not combined, then don't speak a word. You will drive them away. We are commanded to be ready at all times to share our faith, and that is never more important than with kids. You never know when the subject of God and Christ will come up, and you must be prepared ahead of time. That means knowing basic doctrine and the basic tenets of the gospel. It also means giving some thought to how you present those things to kids in age-appropriate ways. These words are not just for the pastors. It's for the seed planters. Be ready. Kids will surprise you. When you're taking a bath, (laughs) when you're eating your ice cream, they don't care what you're doing. They will ask you a question that has eternal ramification, and God is saying, be ready. Be ready. Be clear and avoid abstract language. Children tend to be concrete thinkers. If you tell them Jesus lives in their hearts, many will picture a two- or three-inch tall Jesus sipping an iced tea somewhere near their aorta. Yeah. Break it down. And you look at Jesus and the way he evangelized. He spoke in a language, an analogy that we can all understand. Read all the parables. When you are sharing the gospel with kids, use concrete language and language that they are familiar with. Find ways to express biblical truth in the ways that kids can understand. Number 13, be age appropriate. Understand how kids develop. Part of knowing how to present gospel to children is understanding how children think. There are similarities between kids in terms of what they are capable of learning at different ages. Get online, search for child development, become a student of how kids think and learn. This knowledge will help you more effectively present the gospel to them in an age appropriate fashion. So we're not saying that, you know, get a master's in child development, but you can get enough information online. But don't believe in everything that is said on on websites, but learn from one another and understand how kids develop. There is no formula. Every kid is different. No matter how much you read up on how kids develop similarly, always remember that each child is unique. There is no substitute for personal firsthand knowledge of a child. When you know the details of the child's life, you will be in a much better position to make the gospel personal to them. 
So now it's not just leading them. Now it's not just guiding them. Now it's not just doing lesson studies and programmings and activities, but it's about knowing the children that you are ministering to. It goes back to relationship. And when all else fail, if kid trusts you, they will stay with you. Amen? Keep it short. I need to keep it short. <laughs> I'm trying to go forward. Kids don't have the longest attention span in the world, nor do many adults. Don't sacrifice the depth of the gospel by trying to cram into 30 seconds. On the other hand, be concise and get to the point. Keep it simple, right? When you're sharing the gospel with a child, it's probably not the right time for a discussion of the church, father, church father's views on doctrine of substitutionary atonement. Number 16, never give a child a false assurance. Salvation is about more than a prayer. Now, what does this mean? Unfortunately, much evangelism with kids and adults is geared primarily toward getting someone to say a prayer, like a sinner's prayer. And if you hear them, then they're saved. Salvation is about a whole lot more than prayer. Salvation comes with a choice to make Jesus the Lord, our, uh, Lord of our lives and choosing to follow him. Never assure a child that he is saved merely because he or she said a prayer. You do not know what it is in that child's heart. That's why we need to get to know them. That's why we need to get to know their parents. And that's why we need to, un, you know, get to understand the ins and outs of the, their lives. And number 17, never use guilt, manipulation, or high-pressure techniques. You can fast-track harvesting, but never approach it with this technique. Gospel of our Lord, oh, sorry, is not about guilt, manipulation, or pressuring people into accepting it. Children are particularly susceptible to these types of techniques. So understand we're dealing with impressionable minds. We're, pressured, we're dealing with innocent kids. Now, most people will not set out to employ guilt or, or to manipulate or engage in high-pressure tactics trying to bring kids to Christ. The gospel of our Lord is not about guilt, manipulation, or pressuring people into accepting it. Children are particularly susceptible to these types of techniques. This, met this method is inherently unbiblical. So I guess one of the examples is that it is not our intention to manipulate or to abuse our position. But, for example, we overpraise a kid that just accepted Jesus Christ. And then there's all the other kids who said, wow, this guy singled her out, praising him. And I guess we're just sitting here for the ride. Yeah. And, and, and understanding how that is going to affect the psyche and the mentality of our children, we're here to build them up. We're here to plant seeds, even if they're not reciprocating that grateful art. Back to you. Number 18, encourage questions. Sharing the gospel should be much more of a conversation than a presentation. Encourage kids to ask questions as you present the gospel. This will allow you to not only gauge how well they are getting what you are trying to present, it will also allow them to clarify any portion that they don't understand. And then number 19, involve parents whenever possible. As the saying goes, it takes a village to raise a child. For kids to know and accept Jesus and grow in Jesus, there needs to be a solid support system at church and home. Parents should participate in kids' program and events at church. If you go to all of your kids' soccer game and basketball games, then we ought to be at every single adventure club and Pathfinder club meetings as well. Not sitting in the sidelines, just sipping iced tea. But be in the trenches with them. You know, not to get all up in their faces. But take on the supporting role. I believe that will speak more volumes to our kids to say, man, my dad and my mom has that level of humility to support me in my spiritual walk with God. 
I can sink my teeth into that. I can appreciate. And I believe the stock and, the, and the, uh, their confidence and their trust and everything is going to skyrocket. And imagine if we do this corporately as a body of Christ. We put our kids first. Even if those kids are not yours. Number 20, it's all about relationships. Gospel is about relationships. It is about our relationship with God because he chose to save us from our sins by his grace and not through any work on our part. He also chose to use other people as the vessel for sharing his good news. While there may be an occasion for you to present the gospel message to a child that you do not have a personal relationship with, with, with most children will come to faith through someone they are close to. So do not ever say, I'm going to do this all on my own. It takes the entire village at the home front with our mommies and daddies and our grandpa and grandmas, aunts and uncles. And then when you come to church, it's not just the pastors and the elders, it's everyone. And when kids begin to understand that even that grown up that has nothing to do with the venture club, they're doing something to push the efforts by saying yes to more financial support for that ministry. Imagine if we ever become that kind of a church, kids will be banging at the door to say, I want to belong to a community like that. It is important to build relationships with these kids in order to speak into their lives. It will also be important in continuing the discipleship process, follow, process following uh, the moment of uh, discipleship process following the moment of salvation. So baptismal preparation is super important, but let us never forget that that's just the beginning. It's just a step forward to all of us, grown-ups, the young at hearts, and the young people becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. And so that concludes session number one. And uh, uh, I'm going to try to zoom through this because I believe, Tim, we got one, 50 minutes. <laughs> any questions or any comments before we transition over to, and I just want to let the, the word of God, the passage, speak for itself. It's amazing when you do word studies and when you go from Old Testament to New Testament, there's so much in there about child evangelism. Yeah. And I have yet to, you know, crack open child guidance. I couldn't even get there because it is so rich just opening the word of God. How Jesus views are the little ones. And if we, you know, cross the line, Jesus says, I would rather have you put a millstone around your neck than for you to drown and die. And so that definitely gives us perspective as to how we should deal with our children. When we say children, every children who comes to our church, every youth who comes to our church, even if they are tattooed up, even they have piercing everywhere, and even if they do not smell like us, I'll just stop right there, that we will embrace them, love on them, to say, this is a place that you can belong. Yeah. And we continue to plant that seed. Yes, they will hurt you. More close you get, more trust you build. They will betray you, <laughs> but you keep on planting the seed. So children's ministry is not for the faint of heart, ladies and gentlemen. It's a work of a lifetime. Yes. So, Tim, I did it through Proclaim, and I don't know if we have capabilities. Okay. Yeah, Tim is going to help us out. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't want to blame Cindy for having me do three in a row. <laughs>
But we want to get through this because we also want to get pinned, amen? So uh, is it okay for us to transition over? This one is going to be a little shorter, and the third one is going to be shorter than that. So hopefully we can zoom through, and then maybe we can take questions, comments, uh, any discussions at the very end, if that's all right. All right. So number two, how to lead child to, to Jesus. And, you know, I did want to have some time to have discussions and dialogue. Because believe it or not, I believe each of you have already had experience of leading kids to Christ. Yeah. Maybe it's just so part of you that you, you, you don't really think about it. But you guys are doing it. And so the, a lot of this information is, is, is going to be a summary. You know, uh, uh, it's a affirmation, confirmation. Ministry of Healing 143, it says here, and this applies to leading kids to Christ as well. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with people as one who desired their good. He showed sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he invited them, follow me. Many of times, we would go straight to, hey, I'm a pastor here. Hey, I'm an elder here. Hey, I'm the children ministry leader. Follow me. I'm the security officer. Follow me. No, look at what Jesus did before he even made the invite. If church can emulate this, I want to join the church like that. Amen? Amen. The most effective way to lead child to Jesus is to create an environment where Jesus will be presented as much as possible. This was reiterated at a school board meeting just the other day. Create an environment. We're not just going out there. It's, it's not a solo mission. Create an ecosystem. Create a community. Create an environment where Jesus will be presented as much as possible. You know who do it better than churches sometimes? It's, it's the corporate America. It's called marketing. They market their products so much so that I'm dying to get iPhone 15 plus when I don't need it. But this salvation stuff, we all need it, amen? So everywhere the kids turn, it proclaims the message of Jesus and what Jesus Christ has done for us. It takes a village to raise a child. We need to become a community of believers whom every single person will play a part in leading children to Jesus. You don't need to be in the classrooms. Be in a boardroom making a decision to say, yes, we will release funding for this particular cause. Or be a part of a congregation to say, I am going to continue to speak for the well-being of our children, even though I'm a empty nesters. Because when the time comes, I'm going to say adios until Jesus comes. But I want to make sure that we're handing over the keys to the church. And mind you, the statistics show that we should give the keys to the church to the kids and the youth and the young adults now. So I'm going to base this particular presentation, and I want to encourage you, just go to Avon Source and this awesome kickstart. And so we're not going to be able to go into in-depth, and so I'm so glad for this. this um, it's called the Quick Start Guide Child Evangelism, and here is the source. It's from Avon Source, and it's a 2019 North American Division Corporation of Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, we're the ones that published this. It's just so much. Yeah, it's just a few pages, but so many nuggets. Yeah, just, and I just want to let you know, Alex, Pathfinder and Adventure Club is right in there. Yeah. And every church to stand up and said, we are all about club ministries. Yeah. Let's look at this. Always follow Jesus' example. Always. Always. Success in child evangelism can be found in following the example of Jesus and his interaction with people. Study it. If you want to go deeper and study some more, pick up Desire of Ages. Study it. And have discussion with one another. 
and go back to Ministries of, he he Ministries of Healing, page 143. Read it. Cogitate on it. Reflect on it. Pray on it to say, how can I, what can I do, the steps A through Z, before I can say, follow Jesus, Jaden. Follow Jesus, Kylie. Jesus met where they were. Loved and accepted everyone. Communicated in terms people can understand. Spend time where he's likely to meet and interact with people. Jesus looked for opportunities to introduce himself. Literally, he's like hanging out in the thoroughfares of the Sea of Galilee and villages in town. Just want to introduce himself. Hey, I'm the loving JC, you know. I don't know. That's how you talk to the kids now. But... He was always looking for opportunities to interact with people. Determine the needs of the community he was serving and listen to others. And that's the key, I believe. Listening to our kids and understanding how they communicate, how they speak, and how they take on this stressful world. Jesus celebrated with his new friends and acquaintances, shared a meal, taught others about salvation. Anytime we interact with children, we have the opportunity to lead them to Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. And here at Hemet Seventh Avenue Church, they come to us. We don't need to go door to door. They come to us. So every time we say happy Sabbath to these kids, every time we wave at them, it is another opportunity to lead them to Jesus. If you desire to evangelize the children, you have to become their advocate. Amen? We need to behave like these kids are paying you multi-million dollar contract to advocate for them as their attorney. How to become a child advocate? Remind your church of a value of children. If church is not valuing, speak up. People may not, you know, begin to not like you. Oh, this guy's too noisy. Oh, this gal is just too nuisance. Always talking about kids. Speak up if you are an advocate. Raise the profile of the value of a child. Celebrate the contribution children make to life. Create an awareness of children's need in your church and community. Challenge your church, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Challenge your pastor. Challenge the elders to a new vision of making children first. Teach and encourage the discipleship of children. Provide or point people to resources and support that will enhance children's lives. If you say, yes, I'm going to evangelize the kids, you've got to be an advocate first and foremost. Interact with community leaders who provide services to children and become involved on a community level. Stay current on the culture that shapes the minds and hearts of children today. So getting started, first and foremost important step is praying and asking, that, asking the Lord what he wants you to do. It's not what I want to do. To say, Lord, I'm emptying of myself, and I'm asking you, God, what do you want me to do? Then you must listen and obey, even if God asks you to do something out of your comfort zone. I think I can share this with all of you just briefly. Because Luis, one Sabbath, he shared with us all why he is getting trained up through Master Guide program. That wasn't in his radar. And because it was not his in his radar, he will probably continue to be the Sabbath school superintendent here at this church and done well for us all and for him. But he start praying and he start listening. And all of a sudden, he says, God says, Luis, you're going to take a step back. And you're going to go into a training program of the great I am. And that's why, Luis, you are here. Many of times, God will take you out into your comfort zone. <sighs> you know, uh, talking to kids are more intimidating. I get more nervous going to Masaka to do to, to chapel 
then come over here to preach. I kid you not. Because in, 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 in 10 seconds, I can know right away if I have them or not. And then I have to speak for another 20 minutes. Boy, it, it feels so claustrophobic. Yeah. And so always thinking of ways and, 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 and praying to God so that God will give us the strength. Success in child evangelism cannot be measured through baptism, tied, regular attendance at Sabbath school, continued involvement, or parents accepting Jesus. So how do you measure this success? How do you measure success? <laughs> Look at this. Our job is to simply plant seeds. <laughs> There's no end in sight, ladies and gentlemen. You can try to have metrics and measure. There, there's no measurement. Often we will not see the final result during this life, but results are not our responsibility. They belong to the Lord. The Holy Spirit brings about conversion, not us. So do not, and I'm speaking to myself as well, James, do not get in the way of what Holy Spirit is trying to do to our young people and our children. It's not my job to convict and to convert. It's the job of the Holy Spirit. Some will try to discourage you. Look at this. By pointing out a lack of visible results. You know, and, and stuff like this happens in the board meeting. We need to see the result. We need to see results. Where's the success rate? We need to see results. Okay, you haven't baptized, we haven't baptized anyone? You know, tithe is not going up. Because we continue to dish out money for this ministry that continues to, to absorb all of our fundings. And so some will try to discourage you by pointing out the lack of visible result. Other may believe you are wasting the Lord's money. Don't believe them. Keep focus on the work the Lord has given you. If Jesus was here, I believe Jesus will rebuke every one of those board members. Guys, I paid the price that you cannot buy. So one more thing out of you about lack of visible results, wasting the Lord's money. It puts things into perspective how we should operate as church, as a pastor, as an elder, as a board member, which we are called to make important decisions that makes eternal ramification. If you trust in God and continually ask for his guidance, you will be rewarded. Consider these biblical examples. Nehemiah prayed for Lord's plan on rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. God rewarded his obedience and faithfulness throughout the entire process. You know this story. Moses was worn out with the work the Lord had given him to do. I'm sure if you have been long enough in children's ministry of any kind, you know, if you have hair, you would want to just pull every cuticle of your hair. Because kids will drive you insane. But the Lord sent Jethro to explain his plan to Moses. Jesus knew God's plan for him because he lived a life of prayer. Early in the morning, he went alone to learn what God had planned for him that day. That's why he prayed to say, Abba, Father, what's on the docket for me today? And he just walked right into it. All the way to Calvary's cross. That's the secret. Prayer, lots of it. God will answer your prayer. It may not be in the way you expect or even the answer you want, but stay alert. He will reveal his plans. The most effective way to lead a child to Jesus is to create an environment where Jesus will be presented as much as possible. We, 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 went, we went over this already in the previous session. Just as the saying goes, it takes a village to raise a child. We need to become a community of believers whom every single person in the church will play a part in leading children and youth to Jesus. Amen? And that doesn't mean that everyone has to do children's story. That doesn't mean that everybody has to, you know, sing songs with the kids with a guitar. No. But be there when important decisions are, need to be made. And then, if you're not sitting at the board, 
talk to the board member to say, you guys need to make a right decision. I'm praying for you guys. Some ways your church can support child evangelism. Pastoral support. Support of the pastor is a must. Now I'm talking to myself. He or she is your advocate to the church board and the church. With your pastor's support, others will listen and be more receptive. If pastors are not involved in the life of our children, I'll just speak for myself. If I'm not involved, if I'm not taking part in the life of our children, you need to set me aside. Report me to the conference so that you can have someone who will be sold up for the cause of Christ to speak and to be an advocate. And I just want to say in the presence of God that I need to do this even when I become an empty nester. You know, right now, I think it's easy for me to invest a lot of time because Jaden, to be honest with you, he's 10 and Kylie's 8. They're all part of the whole children's, you know, stuff here. But even after they grow up, turn 18, become, in, become independent, I need to have the same intensity, if not even more. Pastor support. Church board support, ladies and gentlemen. The board will need to allocate funds and support the process. Yeah. Case in point, we had a board meeting. At the board meeting, we're talking about how to allocate funds. One person, not even a board member, was there because we practice open board meeting. Spoke so passionately about our young people. It struck a chord in people's hearts and said to that person, just mark my word, when it comes to it, when the fund needs to be allocated, I will advocate for that cause. Julie, you were there when you were chairing that meeting. Board is not here to lord over anything. We're here to make sure funds are allocated where it needs to get allocated. Yeah. So when you start making decisions as a board or pastors at the very front and say, I want funds to allocate so that I can use $30,000 to renew my office, to have saltwater tank. If I ever bring that kind of uh, foolishness to the board, Again, the board needs to rise up, set me aside, report me to the conference. Dependable leader, if your church agrees to support child evasion, there will need a dedicated leader. This person should be willing to commit at least one year or preferably longer. We're talking about ch ch children's ministry leader. And this leader is not to lord over all the, the you know, the, the, the arms of the, 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 that reaches the children's life, but they're there as a, a hub, as a, you know, a central station to have a bird's eye view to make sure that everybody is working in full cylinders. Amen? Dependable leader, he or she needs to be spiritually grounded, organized, reliable, and people person who understands the development and spirituality of per children. This should be like a default when you look for that leader. The skills of a team building, developing a network of, for accountability and knowing how to delegate responsibility are also desirable traits. Church with progressive attitude. What does this mean? Child evangelism will be a catalyst for many changes and enough members must be willing to allow it to happen. It could potentially lead to many new faces in your church. So don't be afraid for the influx of new blood gushing in to the life of this church. And we are pivoting together. All in the name of our children for the glory of God. Committed group of helpers, remember Jethro's advice to Moses, don't burn out by trying to do everything yourself. The church works best as a body with all members using their talents. So as high as you may go, 
Here's a rule of thumb. You have to strive as a leader to get yourself out of the job. Strive as a leader to get yourself out of the job. What that means is to build trust so that you start delegating these responsibilities and you continue to have the big bird's eye view to know the direction that God wants us to go and we are working together and, and that's the, the next session, how to use our talents. It takes a village. It takes all of us to build up one soul that will enter into the body of Christ and to, to his kingdom. Compassionate Sabbath school leaders. Sabbath school classes must be adaptable to the needs of children and parents who are attending church for the first time. Sabbath school is a great follow-up for children's evangelism event and an important piece of children's evangelism that happens each week. We need to treat Sabbath school as evangelistic meeting that happens every single Sabbath. If we lose that sight, we're trying to build up the body of Christ, always looking for the future of our church and building up our children. As Ellen White says, it is going to be the, the army of our young people who will finish the work before Jesus comes. Best way to reach children is through relationship. This can take time and effort, so be ready to invest both when you become involved with child evangelism. If you don't have the time, if you don't have the heart to build and cultivate relationship, this job will not be for you. Never operate from a positional level to say, I'm the boss, so you ought to follow. You roll up your sleeves and you get in the trenches. And nine times out of ten, kids will follow you more. Because they would know that you care enough that you would get in the trenches with them. When relating to children, remember that a large portion of communication is nonverbal. Children are excellent at picking up nonverbal cues, so it is important to be genuine. My kids can read my mind if I'm not being genuine. And Lord forbid, if I'm not being genuine in my prayer, they will see right through it. But they will keep their mouth shut because they don't want to get disciplined or they don't, want to, they don't want me to start releasing my fury upon them. You have to be authentic. And that's why I always remind my kids, Daddy will do his very best by the grace of God. But please understand, daddy's not perfect. And more I say it, my kids will say, we know that, dad. We know you're not perfect. And we can tell you all the list of things to remind you that you're not a perfect dad. But it's amazing they'll turn around and say, but daddy, we love you no matter what. It's that heart connection. It's about authenticity. It's about relationship. It may, it may take some children longer than others to trust you, but when you do something to show kids that you love and care for them, they will respond. They don't really care about your title. They don't really care how long you have been doing children's ministry. They don't even care how charismatic you are. All they want to know if you care for them or not. Bottom line. It's important to be aware that some children will come with negative attitudes. Think about their broken homes. I don't think none of the kids come here trying to, you know, raise hell or something. That's their normal. So they bring that normal, that toxicity into the church. And these are the ones that need the love of Christ more. However, it is, necessary to to, uh, it is not necessary to tolerate unacceptable behavior. Do not hesitate to set reasonable limits and stick to them consistently. Kids will appreciate that. It's amazing. More I discipline kids in a loving atmosphere, environment, they actually <laughs> begin to smile. I, I think deep inside they know that we are here for them. Yeah. So keep the following in mind as you evangelize the children and youth. All children need love. They need to know there are no gimmicks or expectation in what you offer, but 
that you simply care about them. Yeah. Children need hope for a better life and future. They need to know they were spe uh, specially created by a loving God who has plans for them. They need to know someone accepts them as they are and wants to help them to be all they can be. And here's a big one. In order to fortify what we are doing here at Hemet Seventh Avenue Church or your churches is what happens at home. If you want to fortify here, you got to fortify there. Parents have responsibility to share the love of Jesus with their children. The child's love for God should begin in the home, not at the church, not at the church school. It should begin at home. Parents should exhibit Christian attitudes and regularly pray and study the Bible with their children. You will see the best results if parents are involved in your child evangelism efforts. Here's a question that you can ask yourself as you go home today. When is the last time that I have had worship with my kids? When's the last time that I read Bible with them? Everything happens from home. So here's some of the sample evangelism programs before we transition to the next uh, uh, session. Vacation Bible School. And this is just an example. And so maybe for, for your churches, this might not be, you know, fitting to your culture. But this is one of the examples that you can incorporate possibly. Conducting a VVS that is geared for children for both your church and community is a good way to begin your child evangel evangelism program. VVS provides the perfect opportunity for children from your church to invite their friends. Be sure your ch church's children receive training in how to conduct themselves as host before VVS begins. I know that for my son and my daughter, it's all about friends. If friends goes this way, they would want to go that way. Yeah. They actually listen to them more, better than they listen to us. It's a peer-to-peer -peer influence and accountability. Imagine if we spend the time, entire year, teaching and training our kids how to be a host when we bring more kids to the church. They're going to win them for Christ. And so I believe that as we eventually become master guides, master guides are there so that we can equip and empower our young people to do the work for God. Yeah. Consider training the children of your congregation as junior VBS helpers so that they can experience leadership too. Yeah. Give them, knowing that they're going to make mistakes, knowing that you're going to have cringe moments, give them the rain and to lead out. Maybe after third try, they might do well. But at least the takeaway for the kids to say, wow, these adults have so much patience in me that they let me fail three times and I was successful the fourth time, fourth time, glory be to God because of the support that I've gotten from them. Purpose of VVS, introduce children to Jesus, teach children about the Bible, provide Christian programming, impact young, young lives, provide fun and interactive learning, help children make new friends, introduce people from the community to church members, show love and acceptance for all children, discover the needs of families in your community. I think now and again we need to revisit why we do what we do so that we don't get into a place of complacency. Or else, yes, it is going to be a waste of funding. It's going to be another, you know, a good turnout. But then the next day, there's no one coming back. Because it was just a glorified daycare session for the week. Neighborhood Bible clubs. Now, this is coming from NAD. So this is just an idea for you to get your juice flowing. Neighborhood Bible Club is similar to VBS and sometimes called Sidewalk Kids. It involves a 60 to 90 minute program incorporating drama, stories, music, art, and games to help kids grow in their faith in Jesus. 
instead of inviting children into church because it might become like too much of a high bar for people to come into the threshold of the church. It shouldn't be that way, but it's that way. So there's like a midway point. And so you do it in more of a neutral place like, like your home and your yard or public locations such as City Park. And neighborhood Bible clubs provide a way to invite children from your neighborhood to a church-sponsored activity. Imagine we are opening up our home or going to the park and we're meeting them halfway. And then when the time comes, we give them a flyer to say, hey, we're having a fall festival here. It's also a good way to involve children to attend VBS or might be interested in next year's VBS program, Adventure Club. Let us never forget that this ministry not only builds up our children here at this church, but it is an evangelistic vehicle. Never forget, never forget. Adventure Club sponsors spiritual learning and social setting for children from preschool through grade four. I want to join a church like that where I can learn about Jesus in fun and loving way. Where, you know, it says that when Jesus was growing up, uh, he, he, you know, his stature and he was, you know, his wisdom and knowledge and he was, be, he was beloved by, by Abba Father and everyone around him. So it's the approach of mind, body, and soul. And Adventure Club provides that and not to mention the Pathfinders as well. It brings church and family together to work for the spiritual, emotional, and social growth of children. Again, it will take the entire village. If we make Adventure Club and Pathfinder for a drop-up point for adults, for parents and guardians to say, hey, go to your daycare. We're going to go watch a movie. We need to have some heart-to-heart with the parents. Because we are in the business of saving people's lives. We're not a daycare program. Adventure is a pre-Pathfinders ministry where children earn awards for completed activities. Now, I'm preaching to the choir here. Children Adventures will build a friendship with Jesus, learn how to be a team player, discover God-given talents, and strengthen their ability to get along with others. We are building up leaders, armies that will take over this church. What I experienced today, Annette said, hey, pastor, You think you just lost your job after Rafe preaching today? I know I did. I lost my job. But praise be to God. Perhaps I can retire early if conference gives me more retirement. (laughs) Blessing. Amen. Yeah. Pathfinder Club. Ladies and gentlemen, these are two entities that builds up children and it evangelizes Just having it in your church, it will grow your church. Pathfinders is the next step after adventures for children in grades 5 through 8. The purpose is to provide an active social setting for kids to make friends with God and each other. Sorry about that T. I don't know why it it came in there. Pathfinders offer a wide range of activities, including camping and survival skills, leadership training, outreach activities, interactive training, and variety of categories with awards given for completion. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I want to let you know that it's not just NAD. I am a believer of these two ministries. They are evangelistic. Have it in your church, and church will grow. What is it? If you build it? They will come, these two ministries, tried and tested, and it is true. And I don't want to, you know, get on a soapbox or anything, but why is it that the founder of our conference, and then you look around the world, and these clubs are just dropping off left and right. There shouldn't be Folks from Paris coming all the way here because they don't have club ministries there anymore. I mean, it feels nice to have more people come to our church. But why is the downsizing? 
I think we need to get back to the roots and the heritage and why all of these things have started. If it's not broken, don't fix it. Don't reinvent the wheel. Perhaps, maybe we as adults are not disciplined enough to invest our time and energy. Because, yeah, Pathfinder Club and Adventure Club, it takes a lot of time away from a lot of things. Yeah. I would rather sleep in my king size bed than, you know, rocks and twigs just sticking back, you know. And, uh, yeah, why do you do it? And I was so challenged because when I went to Needle Seventh Avenue Church, of all the churches, they are so big on club ministries. We're camping out in the middle of the winter. And I said, Saul, he's, a, he, he's the uh, master guide, uh, you know, a Pathfinder Adventure Club director. I said, Saul, why are we doing this? Let's not torture ourselves. Let's wait until March when it's nice and warm. Let's go camping then. And he said, Pastor, with all due respect, I'm not trying to insult you. I'm not trying to offend you. But we're doing this because we're trying to prepare for the second coming of Jesus Christ and, and what is coming. So when we teach them survival skills so that they can survive through some, some intense persecution, that's where we need to go back to. And I believe the world is begging for an organization and a community like that. People are saying, I don't want to send kids to public schools. And so we need to create that, that ecosystem, that environment where people get in touch with Jesus wherever they look. Yeah. Mentoring and tutoring program. And, and I'm just going to stop right there because it's, yeah, these are all community events and and, um, and it, 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 Tim's going to send you uh, the, the PDF puppet ministry. Um, it's, it's amazing that, uh, that you can, can convey a message that only puppet ministry can do. Yeah, and, and you can read up about that too. Um, another one is camp meeting. Uh, you know, I don't know when is the last time that we heard these term camp meeting. Each church can have a camp meeting if you have a large enough parking lot. Or you can go reserve a park or a, a campsite. But it's a wonderful, a wonderful way for us to rub shoulders and build relationship with one another and with Jesus. Community Kids Place, Kids Connection Corner. And, and this is just another idea. And so it just goes on and on and on. And then... Oh, here's, here's one that I just want to show, show you. And I think this would apply with anything. Don't try to go big all at once. Start small and grow. Start small and grow. It will test your faith, <laughs> but it's good for your soul. Start small. God will grow it. Yeah. Sidewalk hour. The goal of sidewalk hour is to present an uh, uh, um, This is a typo, yeah. Pardon me? Exciting. Thank you so much. Summertime children's program to your community. Uh, no wonder Spellcheck didn't catch that. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, that's why, grab this manual. Yeah, there's no, I think I found one spelling mistake. Yeah, I should contact NAD about that. But anyway, uh, but more, more spelling mistake here. Uh, Drama Club, uh, this is another a powerful vehicle as well. Other program ideas, here's community fair, technology camp, Easter pageant, Christmas caroling, block parties, summer camp, family evangelism, holiday programs, special community programs, health fair, children's church. I just want to hit a pause button right here and just want to share with you what we do here at Hemet Seventh Avenue Church in regards to children's church. So I came here to this church, you know, a little less than three years ago, and when I heard children's church, I thought the children's church is there to cater to the children. But then, lo and behold, it happens here in the sanctuary with all the adults are here. 
And so the idea is not so much doing something for the kids. Kids are doing something for the grown-ups. So they go up there and they do scripture reading. They go up there and do the, the offering. They go up there and lead us deeper and closer into the presence of God. They go up there and share a message. They go up there and do a drama. They do everything. And sometimes, to be honest with you, it's quite chaotic. Because you're dealing with kids from like three, four years old all the way to who knows what. But I knew that I can sink my teeth into a community where all the adults and even empty nesters will be sitting down and all smiles. They're not even their kids. They're not even their grandkids. And they're cheering them on. And then they go home saying, I was blessed. They say that so much, I get troubled because they don't say that about my sermon. <laughs> but they say so much about what's happening here on Every first Sabbath of the month, all the adults, they sit down. Pastors sit down. We don't have any roles or responsibilities. Kids lead out in worship from beginning to the end. I can be a part of a church like that. Yeah. In summer day camp, midweek kids club and photography club, sports club. And, and so we're, we're talking about evangelism, but back to children's church. So we're getting guests and visitors, and guests and visitors are watching the kids, watching the faces of the adults. And after the service, they're blown away. It's like, wow, you guys will go to this extent to put emphasis on your kids. I can be a part of this movement here. And we're seeing this from Sabbath to Sabbath. And I know that's why, that's why. Cindy, bottom line, why she is doing what she's doing. I know that probably it's going to be better for her health if she doesn't do this at all. But when she was up here talking to everyone about how we need to instill a culture here at Hemet Seventh Avenue Church where we have master guide training program, all of a sudden her granddaughter, Mackenzie, runs over and sits on Cindy's lap while she was sitting on her walker and tears rolling down her eyes. And this was a Sabbath when her, her, her son, Rob, I don't know when is the last time after coming back to church, blessing us with special music. And Cindy with her granddaughter, we're talking about planting seed. And Mackenzie, she's just looking at her grandma because she just want to sit on grandma's lap. And Cindy just stopped everything that she was saying. And she said, guys, this is what, this is why I am going to do this. You spoke with so much conviction. All the board members said, Cindy, whatever you want to do, we will support. And we will continue to support because of your heart for the cause of Christ. So I got five minutes. Can I zoom through this in five minutes and do I fulfill my, my, my end of the bargain? All right. So there's four points. Okay. So give yourself completely to God for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body. We're not even talking about gift. He says use your whole entire being. Yeah to the core of your being as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. This goes beyond your gifts and skill sets and talents that you would just use once a week. But we're talking about offering up to God as a living sacrifice. What you are doing here is making a difference. You are, you're not going to see the results. But you are making a difference because every time you say yes, when you wake up in the morning, you are saying yes to God as a living sacrifice. Four ways to use your spiritual gift. I knew I was going to run out of time. So I thought this was a good go-to because it gives you four 
ways to use your spiritual gifts. I'm going to zoom through this. Um, Tim's going to share this, discover your gifts. That's one. Before you can use your gifts, you need to know what they are. Many Christians have dormant spiritual gift inside of them. Sorry about the spelling mistake. They neglect their gifts, not using them and not even knowing what they are. Do not neglect the gift you heart when God gives it to you. Because when you say yes to Jesus, God gives you the gift. That's what it says in the Bible. And he gives you the gift not for your aggrandizement. He gives you the gift to profit all. So if I'm going to hoard that gift for my own selfish, I don't know, uplifting, then I'm going to be that one talent guy who's going to bury that talent in the ground. It should grow. Do not neglect the gift you have. Imperative. Written in 1 Timothy 4, 14. How do you discover your spiritual gifts? There are three steps. Examine, evaluate, experiment. Examine, evaluate, and experiment. First, you examine by studying each spiritual gift. Read 1 Corinthians 12 and go through. Just Google spiritual gifts. Uh, there's a whole slew of passages that you can study. Then evaluate what you're good at. What are you good at? If you don't know, you can start asking friend, friends what gifts they see in you. I'm talking about friends that will be brutally honest with you. Yeah. Finally, experiment by trying different things. Volunteering for different ministries at your church will help you discover your, sorry, gifts. Do dedicate your gifts to God. Give yourself completely to God for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your, here it goes again, whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Yeah. Maybe you already know your spiritual gifts, but you're just not using them for the Lord. You're using them for yourself. You need to humble yourself and dedicate to the Lord every gift you have. Push all your excuses out of the way and say, God, I dedicate back to you the gifts that you gave to me to begin with. Develop your gifts. Gifts are like muscles. If you have muscles, you got to use it or you're going to lose it. Yeah. Yeah. So gifts are like muscles. The more you use them, the bigger they get. Yeah. It multiplies. Didn't Jesus, through the parable of the talents, said just that? The more you use it. It's going to multiply. You can and should strengthen, develop, and grow any gift God has given you. You get better at using a gift by practice, studying, and learning from other people who have the same gift. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gift. Use them well. To do what? To serve one another. That's why. God gives you talents so that you can give to others. Deploy your spiritual gifts. Deploy means, uh, be, 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 deploy means to put into service. You get out on the field and start doing something. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us Use them. Again and again, the word of God says you need to use what God has given you, even if it's just a morsel. As you think it is, God says, don't worry about it. Just use them. What's the best place to discover, dedicate, and develop and deploy your spiritual gifts? In a small group of other Christians. It's like a testing ground. That could be a small group at your church, a Sabbath school class, or any small gathering of believers that meet together regularly. Use it there. Test it out. And depend on the Holy Spirit. This is not in the article by Rick Warren. I just added there. Depend on the Holy Spirit. This is the last one. 
but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you in all things and bring to your remembrance all things I said to you. And here's desire visions. In describing to his disciples the office work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus sought to inspire them with the joy and hope that inspired his own heart. He rejoiced because of the abundant help he had provided for his church. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that he could solicit from his Father for the exaltation of his people. So in order for you to use your gifts, access the ultimate gift, which is the Holy Spirit. If you're not accessing the Holy Spirit's power, then everything that you do will be done in vain. She goes on to say spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent. And without this sacrifice of Christ would have been no avail. Even Jesus needed Holy Spirit. Regenerating agent. I think about this when I feel burned out. I want to regenerate. My heart is weary, and, 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 and kids are my kids. I'm talking about my kids are wearing me out. But I can always go to God, and through his spirit will gener- regenerate my heart, my soul, my everything. The power of evil had been strengthening for centuries, and the submission of men to his satanic captivity was amazing. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of third person of Godhead. Ladies and gentlemen, when God elevates you higher and higher in positions, and as we eventually become master guides, let not the words master infect our minds like we are now masters of something. As a matter of fact, when I went to the seminary there at Andrews, we were about to graduate, and this one professor, I think he wanted to say something to keep us humble. And he said this, masters of divinity is a blasphemous term. How dare we call this degree a masters of divinity when you cannot master the great I am? And he said, we should change that name altogether. Humble servant of the divine one. Come on. So no wonder we get these degrees. We come out of, and we got this some kind of a a warped sense of, I don't know, this messianic complex like we can save the church. We can save the world. And so we need the Holy Spirit. To counter that pride and the ego and, 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 and you know, the, the sin that, that creeps into our hearts. The Holy Spirit is the only one that could resist and overcome these things that does not exist in our hearts. And it's because it's in our hearts, it messes up the ministry. It messes up the team dynamic. It messes up the whole church. That's why you hear so many things about divisiveness and divisions and disharmony. Who wants to belong to a church like that? And we are doing disservice not only to the people out there, but we're doing disservice to our self. Lord forbid I stand before the righteous judge and said, James, I never knew you. Get out of my sight. Holy Spirit, how to use the, the, the gift that God gives us? Because more you use it, more God will elevate you. And we need to counter pride, ego, jealousy, insecurity, all this stuff that just messes up everything around you. And perhaps maybe before messing up, you know, the ministry that we lead out, it will mess up your marriage. It will mess up your ch- kids. Kids will be so resentful of you and the church and God because they're going to turn around and say, Dad, you were never there for me. And you did it all for God. And if you did it all for God, then I got a problem with God as well because God 
took my daddy away from me. We need the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer. It is the, by the Spirit that the heart is made pure. <laughs> we, we need to strive to be pure when we lead out in ministry. We need to strive to be pure when we become master guides. We need to strive to be pure and genuine and authentic when we become a, the, the body of Christ so that we can emulate. No wonder we, can, we cannot emit the powerful, glorious light of Jesus. Because we need to be made pure. Through the spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil, to impress his own character upon his church. Ladies and gentlemen, how to use your gift, do not ever forget to access the power of the Holy Spirit. And to have the Holy Spirit renew your heart every single day before you get out there and make a difference in the lives of our children. Holy Spirit is a source of revelation and wisdom. And, and there are other things in here, and you will be able to read it yourself. It's quite self-explanatory. But I believe, Cindy, we began, uh, I think, 3.10, 3.15. It's 4.0. Uh, no, 2.10, 2.15. So it is uh, 408. So I'm going to uh, uh, give the, uh, the time back to you, Cindy, or if you have any comments or questions, any takeaway, any feedback uh, in regards to our time together. Uh, but simply what I have done is the part about the children's evangelism, I just relied heavily on this quick start guide. So please grab a copy. Go to Adventist Source. Yeah, has a lot of great information. The rest of it was pretty much coming straight from the Word of God and the Spirit of Prophecy. Um, and so you're getting it straight from the source. Amen. And I preached to myself this afternoon. And I want to thank you, Cindy, for tasking me as I continue to grow in Jesus as well. James, thank you very, very much. Very much. We have accomplished the three seminars right now, so we'll be happy to sign them off. Um, if you're here for all th three, if not, listen to the rest of them. They won't sign it off. <laughs> but anyway, I promise you will. This has been incredible. I've enjoyed all of it. Thank you very, very much. Okay, group, uh, make sure you get the thing signed up before you leave. Um, this March, April, I can't remember what, remember what we're doing next month. It's on my phone. I don't know. I'll let y'all know. Oh, yeah, 28, yeah, 28 fun, fundamental beliefs. Those of you who have, who have not prepared.